aside from self-regulation, there's lots of other social emotional skills that emerge early on, but continue to develop over the lifespan. And the next one we're going to talk about is the skill of resilience. Now resilience goes by lots of names and it is related to that dimension of temperament often called persistence or perseverance. And so this goes along with the idea of continuing to try when you're faced with challenge and not giving up easily. But resilience can also be more than just persistence or perseverance. One component of resilience as named by Dr. Carol Dweck is the growth versus fixed mindset. And so this is the idea that do you believe that when you can't do something, you're never going to be able to do it. And that's just who you are and the things you're good at, you were just naturally good at. If so, that would reflect more of a fixed mindset. A fixed mindset is the idea that what we're innately good at are the things that will always be our strengths and what we're innately not so good at will always be our weaknesses. The fixed mindset is often compared to the gross mindset and the gross mindset is the idea that you can overcome and change what you're good at and what you're not so good at. And that by struggling, this is how we learn. One of the big things pushed through growth mindset research has been that mistakes are good for us. Failing is good for us. As long as it's not a major failure, like becoming homeless, mistakes are great for us. Saying the wrong answer in class is great for us. Struggling when you first try doing a new activity is great. It actually helps our brain to grow. It helps synapses to grow as we make more mistakes. And so the growth mindset is the idea that you do not lock yourself in and assume that you'll never excel in things that you're currently not excelling at. And it's the idea that giving yourself the benefit of the doubt and feeling more confident in yourself. This growth mindset can also help to facilitate self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is the idea that you believe in yourself. You have self-confidence. People with higher self-esteem may have higher self-efficacy, but self-efficacy is not quite the same as self-esteem. Self-esteem tends to be more global versus self-efficacy could be more about specific behaviors. For instance, we might ask parents when your kids are fighting, do you believe you can intervene in a meaningful and functional way? And they might feel like they have high self-efficacy about that, but maybe lower self-efficacy with other parenting dilemmas. So self-efficacy can be much more narrow and specific to very situational events. What we find is that people that have more growth mindset and who are more resilient tend to have more higher self-efficacy in lots of things because they tend to tie their notion of success not to talent but to effort. This really connects well and supports a growing body of literature mainly by Angela Duckworth on grit and how it's really our effort that matters, not our innate talent. And that those who are talented, but don't have a growth mindset, that is if you're innately talented, but you have a fixed mindset, you don't start building a lot of the learning skills. You don't actually learn how to learn or learn how to study. It's the things that come easy to you that you excel at, and you don't learn how to grow out of that shell. Versus if you understand that it's effort that pushes you, you're more so gonna have that growth mindset. You're more so gonna be comfortable with struggling and wanting to try things you're not doing so well. In addition to being tied to the temperamental dimension of perseverance and persistence, this could also be tied to affect. And that is individuals with a more sunny disposition who are just naturally more optimistic and more hopeful may be more likely to have a growth mindset. Not in all cases, but it might be beneficial. Whereas compared to the people that have a more rainy and gloomy disposition might be more pessimistic about what they can do and what they can grow. Now within this perseverance, persistence, resilience, grit, growth mindset, self-efficacy and optimism bubble, there's a lot of stuff going on here, is also the idea of humility. And so this is a related idea that you are not pushed by your sense of pride versus shame. We talked about pride versus shame as these two self-conscious and self-evaluative emotions, pride being when you succeed at something and shame when you are feeling more upset about who you are. And what we often find is that pride and shame are not the answers to each other. They're both just extreme ends of really caring too much about your dog in the race. And that the answer to this is neither of those, but rather humility. And so humility is when you're able to laugh at yourself, admit your own mistakes, accept all the facets of yourself, the socially desirable stuff and the not so socially desirable stuff that you're able to admit that you can't do everything perfectly, but not in like a locked in, oh, I'll never get it way, or I'm not great at that. 
and that's okay. So humility is the idea that you let go the baggage of trying to impress people, especially with trying to impress yourself, that you display what's often known as self-compassion. So self-compassion is when you're nice to yourself, you're not cruel to yourself, you don't have unrealistic ideological expectations for yourself, and you can let it go. So moving towards the self-acceptance can help you to say, hey, it's okay. I don't need to be smug all the time. I don't need to hold, hang my head low when I'm not this perfect ideal. I don't need to be a perfect ideal instead of who, I'm at, who I am. Having this sense of self-acceptance and self-compassion can give one humility and having that humility can help us to, to feel more confident in facing our fears and facing our failures. By doing that, it can allow us to have the growth mindset. So all of this stuff together can help us to bounce back during struggles. It can help us to keep trying, even though things are challenging, and it can help us to enjoy the journey, not this is a means to the end and not just the end goal in sight, that we can enjoy the process. And research has shown that by enjoying the process, we tend to actually succeed better. And so resilience is about just doing things at the space you need to do and letting yourself be flexible to the messy situations that life brings to us. Another very important emotional skill is that of empathy. We already talked about empathy as being an emotion where you feel what other people around you feel. And this is certainly something that emerges very early in our life. As mentioned before, infants who witness another infant cry will often start to cry too and often become upset around them. This has an adaptive flavor to it, as you can imagine. It might alert people and help you raise the beacons and get more caregivers alerted to the problem but it's something that persists. When they see a sibling fall down and get upset, they'll get upset too. When they see someone happy, they'll get happy too. This empathetic imitation really helps us with our social bonds, helps us to connect with others, but it also helps to prepare infants for understanding the emotions in the world around them. So empathy is the idea that you effectively feel what another person is going through as well as cognitively. This is very different from sympathy. Sympathy is the idea that you understand someone's emotions, but you don't necessarily feel them. Sympathy can sometimes get conflated with things like pity. Often when somebody's sympathetic, they might actually be pitying or patronizing a person saying, oh, poor you, that's a hard time. So that's sympathy versus empathy is you feel it in your core. Your body has a physiological reaction in your mirror neurons. And so empathy is, Oh, oh my goodness, you're going through such a hard time and you can feel the emotion in your own body. Again, sympathy and empathy are different from compassion, which is when you can understand someone's feelings, but you also understand their greater perspective. And so this is the idea, you don't just feel what they're going through right now, you understand their motivation and how they got there and some larger things about their situation. Importantly, compassion is not pity. If one of them was similar to pity, it would be sympathy, but compassion is more this grand understanding of understanding their strengths and understanding their weaknesses, understanding their dignity, understanding their humanity. And we can feel compassion pretty easily for the people we love and for the people who we evaluate as good and moral. It can be harder for us to develop compassion for those who we dislike or for those who we have devalued or, or for those who we feel have done very immoral acts. However, compassion in those regards can be very adaptive. For instance, a survivor of abuse who develops compassion for their abuser is not forgiving their abuser and not excusing their abuser. Rather, it's allowing them to take the perspective of their abuser and understanding the abuse they incurred was not their fault. As the survivor, they are not to blame for that abuse. Instead, they understand their abuser did that for other reasons and did that because of their childhood or their cycle of abuse or other limitations in their life. And this can be very freeing and a very major component of the healing process for a survivor of abuse. To let go of some of the really intense emotions they felt towards their abuser and perhaps towards themselves for their past experiences. So compassion is a very powerful emotion that can take us the duration of our life to fully comprehend and to fully understand. But empathy in and of itself tends to be a bit more basic than compassion, but still a pretty complex emotion. It tends to have some cognitive elements, which we'll talk about in cognitive development, but it has two major emotional elements, which we'll talk about now. And they are emotional concern and emotional distress. 
So in empathy, we tend to feel effective altruism. This is the idea we are concerned about the other person. In sympathy, we might not be. It might just be an acknowledgement of their state. But in empathy, we actually are concerned for them, or we're happy for them, or we're fearful for them. So we actually feel something for the person in a way that's altruistic. It's not to benefit us more than them. It's benefiting them more than us. And we also feel emotional distress when the other person's in distress. And this is because of our mirror neurons, we begin to feel the emotion that they are feeling or that we assume or we perceive them to feel. So if we watch someone get hurt in a movie, we kind of glitch, oh, ouch, that looked like it hurt. That is an empathetic response. Or if you're watching a movie and people fall in love and you start to feel captivated by love, that is an empathetic response. Or if you're watching a heated argument and you totally support one side of the argument and you get very riled up about it, that is an empathetic response. And so empathy is the idea of really putting yourself in another person's shoes and having that mirrored emotional response to them. All right, so resilience, empathy, what else are we gonna talk about? We're also gonna talk about autonomy. So autonomy is the sense of independence, the sense that you can do it on your own, not that you have to do it on your own, but that if you desire, you can. And autonomy is this really great feeling where you feel like you're capable of doing stuff for yourself. This develops very early on. When we're a little tiny newborns, we don't really have a sense of autonomy. Right when we're crawling though, our sense of autonomy is I can move, I can do this, or I can feed myself. Or hey, look at me, I can pull myself up to a standing position as my motor neurons become more mature. So as our physical development starts to increase, our sense and our motivation for autonomy also increases. So much so that by the time we're in our second year or third year of life, by the time we're one or two years of age and we're toddlers, we have a huge motivation for autonomy. And what often happens here is parents don't acknowledge how quickly their toddlers are developing and they still think of them as those cute little babies that can't really move around and you have to be really cautious about them. But these toddlers are getting all kinds of skills and they're getting stronger and getting smarter every day. And what often happens is an autonomy conflict. So in toddlerhood, a lot of the terrible twos might be because they're overstimulating and they need a nap, but a big proportion of them could also be an autonomy imbalance. We start to cognitively understand a lot of the world around us, but we can't yet express that due to linguistic barriers. And we want to make decisions and we want to have influence on our lives, but we're still treated as passive recipients. So for instance, a toddler who is completely happy playing with their toys, but they're told now it's time to get in the car and go to preschool, they might rebel against that. Or if they're happy playing with their toys and they don't wanna to go to sleep. Or if they're happy in bed and they don't wanna wake up. Or they don't wanna eat right now. Arguing over routines and transitions and schedules is a pretty normative part of toddlerhood. And it's the way they assert themselves. Arguing over just whether they're gonna get dressed or not. Most toddlers don't really have too much of an opinion over what clothes they wear, but they definitely have an opinion over if they wanna get dressed right now or not. And toddlers, as soon as they can sort of pull the little clothes off, that's one of the big actual rebellions they'll see. They'll, they'll whip the shirt or the pull off pants down and they will use that as asserting their autonomy, asserting their independence and saying, no, I have some control over my life too. We also might see this in terms of who they wanna to talk to or who they wanna run away to. As they start talking and becoming more verbal, they will start to assert themselves even more. Eventually we get it and parents say, okay, okay, you're toilet trained, you can feed yourself, you can dress yourself in the morning, I got this. But then as the child continues to develop, parents have to struggle and readjust how much autonomy is age appropriate again. And this is something that continues on and on and on, especially in their social interactions. They might wanna to talk to their friends without the parents eavesdropping, or they might wanna start making breakfast for themselves. And what we find is there's lots of cultural variation in terms of what skills parents are okay with the child trying at different ages. And so it's the idea that while our physical skills are developing, we might not actually be attempting them unless we're giving that space for autonomy. And then, of course, when we get to teenagers, this is the next big section where a lot of conflict happens. So this may happen when the teen wants their own cell phone, when they want to start dating, when they want their curfew to be later, when they want their driver's license, when they want to move out, when they want to move across the country to go to college. And this can really be overwhelming to parents who still see them as their little baby. And so it keeps being renegotiated how much autonomy is appropriate 
based on their age, based on their personality and their temperament, based on their social skills and their cognitive skills, and it's really a never-ending negotiation. You might still have a parent in your 30s who calls you and makes sure that you did your taxes, for instance. Or in university, you might have a parent that wants to really hover over you and help pick your courses in university. What's really important, though, is that while you're going through this, the parent is allowing the child to have a sense of self-efficacy. If there's not enough support for autonomy, we tend to have kids that don't believe in themselves, who don't believe they can do it. And when they assess risk, they assume the world is more dangerous and more scary than it really is. Also, support for autonomy really helps us with our problem-solving skills. We know this is, even though this is the unit on emotional development, this is really overlapping with our cognitive development. Supporting this sense of autonomy helps us cognitively and it helps us to grow in other avenues. It helps us with our social skills, helps us with our sense of physical skills if you're letting kids rough house or rock around really rough rocks at the beach or, or what have you. And it's okay. Now we talked a lot about social emotional milestones in this and the milestones around social emotional skills tends to be more broadly defined than our physical gross motor or fine motor skills. But here's just a brief chart about some of the skills that develop over the course of our first five years in terms of things like shows cooperation, takes turns, uh, plays alone, wants to please others, and different types of skills that start to emerge. We'll talk about this again when we get back to social development.